Good afternoon, everyone. We're slowly settling into this very last session of the day. It's great to see all of you, so many. We're going to try and make this fun and exciting so that you're not going to fall asleep in this last uh, session, in this late afternoon. Um, I'm not going to stand between you uh, and the well-deserved evening. Um, but I am really, really excited about this panel. Uh, my name is Christian Meyer. I'm a researcher here at the University of Oxford and the Center for the Study of African Economies. Um, and um, I'm going to be trying to take us through this panel with our wonderful uh, panelists this afternoon. Um, this panel is on the role of online job matching platforms in uh, promoting economic inclusion, question mark, perhaps. Um, and we think this is an important issue because, as you've heard from Dr. Akebe um, in our keynote, Unemployment is at the top of the priority list for many policymakers on the continent. Don't need to tell you, it's a devastating waste of human uh, capital, of human potential uh, for young folks to go unemployed in 2019. Out of the 1.2 million young people aged 15 to 24, close to half are not enrolled in education, employed, underemployed, or engaged in informal employment. We're neat, not that I like this term. Um, and young women tend to be twice as likely to be out of education, employment, or training as young men. So it's not a good, not a good situation. Against this backdrop, there is an increasing amount of interest, excitement around the, on, the role of tech, specifically online job matching platforms that have emerged as a popular tool to bring both sides of the market together, to connect job seekers with jobs. And indeed, there is now robust evidence, including by my colleague Kate and many others of you here in the room, that information frictions do um, are, are an issue, especially in low- and middle-income country uh, labor markets, and they hinder the uh, ability of young folks to find good jobs. At the same time, it's also worth noting, right, we're economists, typically young people have strong incentives to find good jobs, and firms have strong incentives to find good workers. So one might say, well, the market is going to fix this. And indeed, the amazing review by um, Karanza McKenzie, JEP, just came out, highly recommended, um, you know, points to the fact that only a tiny number of matches in especially middle-income uh, labor markets, middle-income country labor markets, come through public and private employment services. So then the question is, what is a rationale for a government or a development organization to be so excited about the role of online job matching platforms or um, both private and public intermediation solutions? What is the rationale? Well, I'd say there's maybe two arguments, but I'm curious to hear from the panelists and others in the room if there are others. Two arguments that I can think of. One is um, reducing information frictions helps with the reallocation of labor in these labor markets, reallocation of labor across space, across sectors. I have worked a lot with my uh, friends and colleagues in Ethiopia, again, going back to the keynote by Professor Akebe, including on uh, the garment industry. And we have back there set up a uh, online sort of matching solution, which indeed I do think helped the government reallocate young workers, uh, find jobs in the garment industry. So I, I do believe in this sort of allocative efficiency argument. The second argument I think that one might make, and perhaps that's more important, are equity concerns, right? We know that in many contexts, networks play a large role in who finds jobs and who don't, with the people who do and the people who don't find jobs. And we know that underserved communities often fall short. They don't tend to have these networks. So, you know, innovative solutions, including online job matching platforms, could perhaps help these underserved communities tap into um, networks that help them find jobs. It also remains a question, though, with these rationales, to what extent tech perhaps poses new challenges in terms of access and inclusion. Not everyone might have access to a smartphone. Not everyone might be able to afford the mobile data that's needed. So that's sort of, I'll stop here, but that's sort of some of the challenges and some of the questions that we're hoping to discuss in this session. Um, initially with a set of uh, excellent panelists uh, from across the policy, academic, and practitioner uh, spectrum, and then open to you for 
hopefully critical, uh, engaging questions that challenge us and the panelists here. Let me briefly introduce the panelists here with me today. Um, I'll start with Radu in alphabetical order, Radu Ban, who's a senior program officer uh, on the Women's Economic Empowerment Team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, he manages a portfolio of research and evidence, the things that we produce here as academics in this space. Um, on uh, women's economic empowerment. Uh, before joining the foundation, he was with our friends at DIME at the World Bank, and before that, he got a bachelor's degree in economics from Harvard and a PhD in economics from LSE. Then right next to me is our wonderful colleague, uh, Monica lambon Querfio, who is a researcher and senior lecturer at the University of Ghana. Perhaps more importantly, she's also a CSAE visiting fellow this year. And so that's my plug for the CSAE visiting fellowship. I think the new round came online today. So, you know, if you're a younger African researcher uh, who has a PhD and who is, might be interested in spending some time here at the university, talk to us, talk to us from the CSAE team and talk to Monica um, uh, about this uh, fellowship that we have. Monica is an applied microeconomist working on labor markets, women and children, we children's, children's welfare, digital innovation. She has an, an extreme breadth of extremely impressive work. I'm a big fan of her work. And I'm so, so, so pleased that she's with us here at CSAE this term. She's also a research fellow at the Transfer Project of um, ACE. EIR and a non-resident fellow at SEGA and a JPL invited researcher. And she has a bachelor's in economics uh, and mathematics from the University of Ghana and a PhD in economics from Clark University. Belinda, who is uh, all the way over there, is a chief product officer for Harambi, Youth Employment Accelerator, a non-for-profit social enterprise uh, in South Africa that works closely with partners from government to civil society to build African Solutions for the Global uh, Youth Employment Challenge. Um, she is responsible for overall strategy, design, and um, the sort of experience that young people and employers have when interacting with Harambi's project. And she's also a, a, um, an extremely important research partner to both Kate and myself uh, in, uh, I I'd say, cutting edge uh, research uh, in this space. Uh, she uh, has qualifications in interactive media and behavioral evolutionary ecology, which also makes her super thoughtful and interesting and an interesting thought partner as an economist. And then finally, Kate, my wonderful colleague here, uh, who is uh, faculty at the Blavatnik School. She's an associate professor in economics and public policy at Blavatnik and a supernumerary fellow at Merton College. She's worked extensively in this space at the interface of research and policy um, she's worked with NGOs, governments, with the World Bank. She's worked extensively with Harambi, with BRAC. She's also, together with Stefan and Alan Stein, uh, the director of the Mind and Behavior Research Group here at the university. Um, Kate holds an undergraduate degree from UCT and a MPhil and DPhil from Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. So we have a ton of impressive um, panelists here uh, to, to tackle these questions. I will shut up um, and turn to the panelists for a set of opening statements. So we'll start with a little bit of a discussion here and then uh, sort of open to the room for discussion. Does that sound good? Cool. Let's start with the first round of questions. Kate, let me start with you. You've worked extensively with Harambi in South Africa and you also have uh, are the author of one of the seminal references on two-sided information frictions uh, that has emerged from that collaboration. Before we go deeper in the work that you have done and that Harambi is doing in this space, um, I'd like you to zoom out a little bit and tell us about this recent uh, review article uh, for Vox Def, Lift, uh, Vox Def Lit that you have done um, on barriers to job search and hiring in urban labor markets. From your view of the literature, what do you think? How could job search platforms like the one that Harambi is running and the one that many policymakers are excited about, what barriers could they tackle and what evidence is there on their ability to do so. Um, so uh, just to just to kind of plug the reviews, so Chris uh, Woodruff and the team at VoxDev have done a series, if you haven't seen them, of reviews called VoxDev Lits, which summarize in sort of 20 to 30 pages the state of the literature um, in a sort of area and the live reviews, so they keep on getting updated. So we just released in February um, the, the issue of that on search and matching frictions in urban labor markets. Um, so 
that was co-authored with um, Stefano Carrier, uh, but also Alison Andrew, um, who's here, Rob Garlick, um, Rachel Heath, and Harika Singh. So please have a look at that. Uh, that covers a lot of the research in the space, and it's, you know, very, very recently released. I, I think there, you know, we... We started by actually look before we went into the intervention evidence, we started by kind of trying to characterize what we've learned from the descriptive data sections of all of these RCTs that have been going on in uh, urban labor markets recently. And there are a couple of stylized facts that I think are interesting to highlight because I, I, my take home answer on the sort of job tech platform is it it's uh, you know, these platforms are going to help in urban labor markets to the extent that they they address the market failures that we know are there. So we've got to think about it. Tech is not a be all and end all solution. We've got to kind of try and understand why the markets are failing and then see the extent to which tech is going to help that. So that's my kind of take home answer. But the the three things we picked up in these these labor markets are, you know, first of all, both firms and workers face very high search costs. So the average job seeker in urban Ethiopia, Uganda, Jordan, South Africa is spending about 20% of, you know, what a person in, you know, if they had a job, uh, that person's earnings, um, you know, that's what they're spending on search often when they're, uh, when they're unemployed. That's kind of transport data costs. Um, you know, the, the costs of printing CVs and those sorts of things. So the search costs for workers are super substantial. So are the search costs for firms. Um, so firms are uh, report that they really struggle to find the kinds of applicants that they want, would trust, think are you know skilled enough. If they post an open vacancy, they get flooded with thousands of applicants for like a waiter or front of house person. They have no way of distinguishing between them. So you've got huge search costs for both sides of the market. The second market failure is that it's very hard for both workers and firms to signal their, their skills and what would make them uh, you know, good for a job. So in many of these countries, people don't trust the educational qualifications or schooling is so bad that, to be honest, there's no differentiation between most of the candidates who've been to any except the very top schools. And so as a result of these, um, you know, the, the employer's struggling to differentiate between candidates and there being, you know, lo loads of applications that they're receiving, employers often in these labor markets use referrals. So they'll basically get someone they trust, either a current employee or someone uh, at their church or something like that, and they'll refer someone who they know. You can see immediately that, and we know that that has terrible consequences for women and for people who are less well-networked. So I think you know, there's huge potential for job platforms to answer some of these issues. You could immediately see, well, search costs are definitely going to go down relative to traveling into the city center and dropping off your CV. Like that, that, you know, that that could very easily be quite helpful. But equally, I think they're, they're not necessarily helpful if we don't think about some of the other market failures that are going on. The key thing I would want to say is, uh, you know, you need to deal with the signaling problem on job platforms because otherwise you just get employ uh, you know job seekers putting in loads and loads of applications firms getting thousands of applications and then what we've actually seen in a number of instances is the platform kind of bombs out um, so employers stop using it because they're not learning anything from the applications and so I don't I don't want to be the downer like right at the beginning but I would say we've got to step back and think a little bit more theoretically about what these interventions could um, are trying to achieve, not just saying, oh, we're going to move the market online and it's going to be more techy, so therefore it's, you know, it's going to work better. It probably won't. I agree. I think that's a very sensible, uh, healthy way to start the session. Um, Monica, maybe turning to you, um, you know, you're an academic with a breadth of fantastic work in this space, but you also worked... Um, to set up essentially a job search platform in Ghana called Text to Jobs, um, Text for Jobs, that has effectively connected young Ghanaian job seekers to economic opportunities. Um, you work particularly hard to design this platform in a way to um, be inclusive, especially of lower skill workers. You've worked with the public employment service sort of hand in hand. Can you tell us a little bit more about the broader project, um, uh, this platform that you've set up and some of the findings that have emerged from this so far? And we're going to dive deeper in this, into this question of inclusion later on. 
Um, so this, um, actually, this idea was born out of um, an intervention, an evaluation of the government's online portal. So the Youth Employment Agency sets up this online portal to um, make it easy for, you know, the, the search costs, to minimize the, the search costs that Kate just um, spoke about. So we as researchers went in there to evaluate it, to see how effective it was. Um, in the course of the evaluation, we quickly realized <laughs> that the, the platform um, was, its, its effectiveness was being limited by some contextual, like, you know, factors. So people who wouldn't have, so like there's informality issues. So it was excluding um, micro enterprises. It was excluding uh, medium scale enterprises. Um, and it was excluding um, people who wouldn't have access to um, smartphones, people who don't have access to internet, for instance. So um, I remember we went back to the government and told them, okay, this is a problem you are trying to solve, but you are actually taking a lot of the people who need it out of the, mm -hmm. um, you know, of, of the platform. But obviously, you know, constraints and all that. So we, 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 we started thinking about how to make the online portal more inclusive. So we considered um, a text-based um, intervention. So um, instead of accessing the platform through an app or instead of uploading your CV onto the platform, we thought, okay, in Ghana, many people, um, I think the, the percentage of people who have access to smartphones, uh, no, it's not 100%, like, you know, about a third of people don't have access to internet. So we thought, okay, um, there's people have um, the analog phones. A lot of people have the analog phones. So how do you use technology or leverage on that to be able to get them access to um, this kind of technology? So we designed a text-based um, intervention. So you just dial a short code. So in our case, I think it was star 899 star 74 hash, for instance, and it immediately becomes interactive. Are you looking for a job or are you an employer? And then it becomes interactive and, you know, and um, the platform was set up in such a way that it would cater to people who do have access to um, uh, internet and those who don't. So it was more inclusive. And um, by that, we were able to get... Um, firms that were able to uh, upload low skilled jobs people who don't who have um, low digital skills be able to access the platform because even if you're not able to um, you know fill the forms yourself we set up a small um, call center where if you say you don't you are not able to access um, internet um, somebody calls you and gets the information um, from you. And it, it was very interesting what the findings um, were. We, we, we got some money from IGC, International Growth Center, to be able to um, pilot this idea. We ran it for about 10 weeks. We didn't have a lot of money to go around the whole of um, the city, so we just did around the university. We designed flyers, like, you know, T-shirts. We actually, you know, came up with a jingle <laughs> to be able to, you know, get people to know about this, just to see if this actually works. And over um, uh, the course of 10 weeks, we were able to get um, about 1,500 jobs. We were able to get about 1,400 job seekers interact on the platform. And about uh, at the end of the 10 weeks, about half of those um, positions were matched. And the, the platform was such that um, once a match is established, so if I'm a job seeker and there's somebody else who is a, a, a firm who puts, um, you know, the information on the platform, as soon as um, the two of us match it, uh, along certain parameters that we had set, um, you know, I would receive a text message instantly with the details of, you know, whether to, like, uh, how to actually apply. But then we leave it there. We don't go further. We, um, we, we also did a survey just to be able to understand um, from the job seekers perspective and also from the firm's perspective how best to um, make the portal work. There were issues around um, cyber security. There were some issues that like, you know, they, they raised that right now we are actually um, seeking um, for funds to be able to test certain aspects of the um, platform to learn a bit more what actually works. So I think um, this is what I'll say for now, and then maybe come back later if I okay. follow up. No, no, I think that, that sounds great. Um, maybe moving over from, you know, the a platform in the earliest stages to a platform that is extremely mature. Mm. Uh, Belinda, um, you know, you're responsible. Oh, I mean, you're responsible for the product um, of arguably 
one of the most, if not the most successful um, youth employment intervention on the continent. Um, the uh, SA Youth uh, Mobi site that uh, that Harambi is operating. Um, can you give us a little bit more of an overview to the work that Harambi Youth Employment Accelerator is doing, um, and specifically um, uh, this site that that you're operating and the broader, perhaps, presidential youth employment initiative that it's part of? Sure. So um, Harambi Youth Employment Accelerator tries to accelerate youth employment. Um, <laughs> it's in the name. Uh, and we take, you know, that's not just about the formal sector for us. We try to increase any kind of activity of young people in which they're improving their livelihoods and also growing the economy. We currently operate in South Africa and Rwanda. Um, and over the last decade, we've pathwayed one million young people into an employment opportunity and provided support to over four million um, additional young people to help them find, get, or stay in an employment. And I think those are the numbers, um, Christian, when you're you know, talking about success, those are, are the numbers that people have. But the reality in South Africa is that the problem is huge and the problem is growing. And it's taken us 10 years to do a million, but we actually need to be so much faster. Um, I think that the two big bits that we have to achieve that are through product and partnerships. Product, I think it's quite obvious. It's how you can scale interventions at like a population level. Um, and in terms of partnerships, I think it's just a realization that we, no single organization or entity can really solve these kinds of problems independently. So the Presidential Youth Employment Initiative, which is one of the partnerships that we've been quite privileged to be part of, is an intervention that's run out of the um, presidency's office in South Africa. Um, it essentially provides a level of uh, oversight support through a variety of mechanisms from strategy to funding. Um, and it's not meant to replace any of the existing initiatives that either government uh, private sector or community-based organizations are running. Um, it's really to try and accelerate all of those things together, and they have a particular focus on building healthier relationships between stakeholders in the ecosystem, um, so particularly between government and private sector. Uh, part of that Presidential Youth Employment Initiative is um, a network of networks called the National Pathway Manager Network, and that is both a conceptual framing around a group of organizations and entities that are working towards a common goal, but it is also a technical network. So um, the idea is that young people, because of the barriers in terms of accessing information, really need um, technologists and governments to do a lot more work in consolidating the opportunities that are available to them. So... SAU.mobi is our version of the site that accesses that network, but um, the Department of Education and Labor is also busy integrating into it. Uh, we have a private sector partner on board now um, and a number of community-based organizations. And the idea is that that network of opportunities would be available through whatever platform and or channel is most relevant to the young person, you know, based on where they are and their access to technology and the like. Um, so our, our platform within that, SAYouth.mobi, um, it's a mobile-first platform. It's web-based, so you don't have to have a smartphone. It's free to use in terms of our services, but it's also um, free to surf. So in South Africa, internet penetration is pretty good, um, but data is the cost of data is just a, a really big barrier. And we also have a, a call center um, that's toll free because even with internet penetration being what it is, we have some young people that we just, they either um, can't use the platform because they live in very rural areas without connectivity or, you know, for other reasons. So we've, we've done both to kind of support in those, in those two ways. And at its heart, you go onto our platform, uh, you provide a bunch of information about yourself as a young person, and we match you to jobs. So we try to provide you with your next best step for what you should find, mostly entry-level work. And then we use that same match to present a ranked list to employers about who they should employ. Um, we use, obviously, the traditional sort of signals around uh, employment and education. 
um, a lot of the young people we work with don't have uh, any kind of post-school education and they probably haven't had their first work experience. So we know that those signals are fundamentally exclusionary. Um, so we have additional signals around things like uh, distance from the job, because we know that your distance from a job is a good predictor of your uh, likelihood to stay in that job. And we also do things to boost the profiles of people who might have been previously economically excluded. So young women on the platform um, and uh, individuals who went to disadvantaged schools get like a bump in, in our, our matching algorithm. And then we work with um, people uh, like Kate and yourself uh, to, to add additional signals to this, this batch of things. So really we are looking at new ways for young people to be able to signal their potential at scale and through tech. And I love this point about sort of ecosystems, you know, you really are sort of, you're, you're thinking beyond just your own organization because I, I do think this really resonates that it's not just, it cannot just be one small platform. It needs to be an ecosystem of partners who are working together to tackle this challenge. And I'd love to go more deeply into this. Um, maybe before we do this, Radu, over to you. Um, in your work at the Gates Foundation on women's economic empowerment, um, you work with partners around the world to improve income generating opportunities for, uh, for women. And you think, you, you think about this challenge through several levers, right? How would you say, what is the role of digital tools, digital platforms, um, in your work towards this goal? And, where do you focus your efforts and what do you think are as sort of wearing the, you know, the, the evidence hat, what do you think are some of the evidence gaps, some of the unanswered questions that academics here in the room um, should, should work on? Yep. So thank you for, thank you for the, the opportunity, Christian. Um, I was actually paying attention a little bit to how you introduce everybody. I was, I was afraid they're going to run out of stereotypes so you had the the academic the policy the implementer so what am i going to be but you you yeah. kind of you kind of <laughs> skip that uh, in, a, in a nice and, and, and diplomatic way but uh, <laughs> but so so yeah so we're uh, on the women's economic empowerment team as the as the name suggests we we're looking at ways in which we can um you know increase women's income but also their control over income and as, as christian was saying we can do that through, through different channels now, with the with the growth of um, of these digital job platforms, obviously, you know we're 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 quite keen to see how those can be gender intentional and or gender transformative. What we've seen with the, with the evidence current currently to date is that okay, we through the the work uh, of many people in this room on these job platforms, we have a much better understanding of the problem, like what generates this gender gap in, uh, in employment, right? So for example, from, from um, the work on the Job Talash platform in, in, in Pakistan, we understand that the, the barriers are more on the, on the demand side. So you have all these job requirements that basically drive women away from, from applying. So it's not that women don't search. Actually, the, the gap in uh, employment is larger than the gap in search efforts. So women search more than, than uh, so that's not the barrier. Now, from the work in the, in the, on, on Nigeria uh, job matching platform, we see that actually the, the problem is on the search side. So women search less than would be predicted by the level of qualification. Right, so that's one thing that we've learned. Like the, the the job platform give us a much better better understanding of the of the problem. Like what causes the the gap in um, in in labor market outcomes. What we don't see yet is um, how the job market market platform can actually provide solutions. And I, actually, this is one of the the things that um, you know uh, Kate's review paper also 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 highlights is that. Uh, there is a promise there, but we, in terms of concrete evidence of how job market platforms provide a solution, meaning you know reducing some of these gender gaps, I think it's it's uh, it's early days. We know that these job market platforms they can work in a gender neutral way. So you know also job talash show that with a little bit of uh, you know targeted information, you can drastically reduce the search cost and like increase the matches by like six times. But it doesn't say anything about the the gender impact. So they work in this gender neutral way. We just want to understand how they can work in a, in a gender intentional or, or gender transformative way. So let me, 
let me stop there. This is what we're looking for. We're looking for evidence, right, in this space, but evidence that shows the potential of these platforms to to reduce some of these these persistent gaps. And I think, in a way, this is a great uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you for 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 this opening. And I think, rather, this is a great segue into maybe the first topic that I'd love to go uh, into a little bit more, which is is this question of um, uh, equity and inclusion. Um, you know, if we think about, oh, tech as the, you know, perhaps we can help with equity, inclusion of otherwise underserved groups. Um, but also it poses new inclusion challenges. And so, um, perhaps specifically viewed through the lens of to what extent these solutions can be gender transformative, as you said it, Radu. Um, starting Monica with your work in Ghana. Um, what do you think, um, you know, as you have built this platform through the lens of academ an academic, but also working closely with a policymaker, what do you think are some of the um, features of this platform that you've thought specifically about from an inclusion perspective? And what are some of the emerging findings, perhaps getting a little bit to Rado's question about some of the gaps, but also um, uh, some of the transformative impacts that it, that it can have specifically with a view to, to, to equity. All right, so, um, Sorry. so in terms of, in, in my context in Ghana, what, um, like I said, what we found was that most women were being cut out of the, um, the online platform that had been built by the government because the kinds of jobs that were being put up would naturally exclude these people because these were high-end jobs. So um, the low-level skills jobs wouldn't be found on, the, on those. And if you talk about access to internet, for instance, I mean, um, the Africa Development Bank's recent report is showing that the access to internet in Africa is about 35%. But even with that, um, women have lesser assets. Like the access for women is, is lower. Highly I think, yeah, 24% versus 35%. So if you have a platform that re requires people to use internet, that is one way that you're excluding right. them. If you are if you have a platform that only focuses on the high-end kind of jobs, you are excluding um, women. If you have a platform that is designed in such a way that um, women or people would need um, um, some level of digital skills to be able to um, engage with the platform, you are actually excluding women. In our design, um, and we, we've not had the chance, the opportunity to like, you know, test this out, but one of the ways we are thinking of using text for jobs to be able to do this is to, um, right now the platform is such that we, we are matching people on predetermined parameters. What we are trying to test now is to make it dynamic for women because we understand that, um, women value certain attributes, you know, differently compared to men. So if, if you're a woman, um, you are likely to value um, maybe the flexibility of the job, the location of the job, um, things like that, even the safety, something that gives you an idea of whether this job is safe or not. So those are the things that we are trying to incorporate in the new iteration of, of this so that hopefully we'll be able to actually test it and see if this is something that helps um you know, women more. That this is how we are using text for jobs to deal with some of these um, things. That even though you're using a platform, you are actually excluding them because of the features that you have on these platforms. And you would say that the other solutions that are out there in the in Ghana by the government, the government's own platform, or some of these other private providers are are sort of not as intentional about this. I, I don't think they are. So in Ghana, for instance, the, we, ha, we do have, like, we have LinkedIn, we have Jobaman, uh -huh. we have, right. those are things that people would have to pay um, to, to access, right? So in our case, we, we actually try to um, pitch this idea also to um, the Ministry of Employment um, for them to, to try and also test it out. But like, you know, there's always the pushback that, you know, oh, there are other things we are dealing with. We will come back to this later. So on our end, we are just trying to build the evidence. If you have this dynamic um, feature of the platform, does it help women? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to be honest, as we sit here, I don't know because we haven't been able to test it yet. But these are some of the ideas we have to be able to make it um, easier for, for women to, you know, um, really tap into the opportunity that these platforms bring. I think that Radu would probably be a good person to to think about how to take evidence and then to convince the government to yeah. to, to to maybe change things. But 
No, yeah, yeah. I was going to I was going to continue with with some of the academic work on this before and uh sure. specifically since you mentioned Joberman uh, and I saw Belinda Archibald somewhere earlier but I think she's gone. Um but Kate maybe through the lens of this recent review um including on the work by Belinda uh, on Joberman in Nigeria what is your take on the sort of gender specific barriers and the gender specific impacts that some of these digitally enabled solutions could have? So, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot about the labor market that these platforms don't solve. So right. I, could, I can start with, with that. I mean, I think the first thing we're seeing is that there, there is actually documented evidence that um, women are discriminated against, even if they have qualifications. So, right. mm -hmm. you know, we now know that, uh, Employers prefer women, uh, you know, uh, female versus males, uh, CVs less in developing country contexts. They tend to have develop, uh, more gendered preferences in terms of how they put together job um, applications as well. And so as a result, women, uh, the sorts of jobs, uh, so women are discriminated against if they go um, up against, uh, you know, similarly qualified men for a job. But also they have preferences, partly dictated by social norms, partly just because people have preferences about having more flexible work, um, lo uh, fewer hours, less of a commute. And so they find fewer of the kinds of jobs that they want. Um, so we have evidence of those sorts of things now, and that's, that's kind of covered in the review. I think in terms of, you know, I, I don't know necessarily that platforms on their own, just like you know, employers having information about more workers is going to solve anything of that, actually. I think one needs to take a bit more of what Harambi calls a systems change approach. And some of the work, I think, you know, it hasn't actually been some of the work that we've been evaluating, but um, some of the work Harambi has done is around sort of more employer advocacy. So just employers understanding women's preferences and the attributes um, of jobs that women are looking for. So sort of going, uh, using the research to sort of speak to the firm side. I think in it, it hasn't been, your work hasn't been so much on gender, but from uh, the, the sort of things that I know, um, there's been a lot of ways in which Harambi's actually managed to change how employers are structuring work in ways that are more inclusive. So basic things like making sure that work seekers get their paycheck, um, you know, a bit of their paycheck at the beginning of the month so that they can pay the transport costs to get to the job and they don't first get paid at the end of the month um, or sort of things around basic working conditions. And, you know, and surprisingly, if you give people terrible working conditions, they're more likely to be absent and quit their job. You would have thought firms would have figured that out, but they hadn't. Um, so I think, I think actually um, to me uh, on the gender side, some of the, that work is going beyond the platform, but, you know, maybe the people who are running those platforms are able to aggregate and convey information in a way that, uh, you know, can change some of the way that firms are disadvantaging women. You've always got to then have a profit motive for that. Um, and I think that's the, that's, you know, maybe the final thing just to end on some of the studies is that, um, you know, some of the studies are showing that, the women who are excluded are of as good or better quality than, uh, you know, some of the men who are getting the jobs. And so I think that piece of evidence is absolutely key to convince employers that this is something they need to take seriously. Um, so that was used on sort of more formal, like numeracy and kind of communication type tests. But there's also growing evidence that, uh, you know, a lot of the female applicants have very good soft skills as well. So I think it's about making that kind of case to employers that this is something that can improve your bottom line as well as being important for uh, sort of gender equity stats. Which is a nice segue. I mean, I don't, I don't need to moderate every step of this. You should feel free to come in on this. But I do feel that uh, um, Belinda, uh, Kate has almost put you on the spot here to talk a little bit more about how Harambi thinks about uh, sort of specific equity concerns, which in South Africa obviously go beyond just women, but um, specifically also some of the work that you've, as Harambi, been doing around gender, uh, gender um, sort of barriers um, and, and tackling these barriers in the labor market would be great to hear. Yeah, so um, I think that the sort of notion around advocacy is, is really important. Um, and we have teams that advocate at the level of a firm and then also at 
the level of industry bodies for more inclusive hiring practices, um, which is definitely has the gender lens as well as other elements we bring into it. Um, it is difficult to navigate those conversations because we have both sort of a hat of trying to be as inclusive as possible and also a hat of um, trying to convince employers to hire through us so that we have those jobs available for young people. Um, and largely the conversation is around de-risking. So they want more and more signals to de-risk their hire as much as possible and doing having that conversation with an evidence-based inclusion lens is, is, is challenging. Um, our, our platform is uh, almost 70% women. So from that point of view, we have we have a large network of women who use us to find work. But I think, Ruddy, your point around have we actually managed to achieve gender neutrality or have we done something more is very valid. Um, even with that network skew and the fact that we bump women up in the algorithm, um, we still have hired approximately 50-50. So uh, that's a really good call out. I think within sort of our advocacy piece, um, having this link into government has been really, really helpful. Um, if we can convince government to provide tangible incentives for industries or firms to hire um, more inclusively, that really helps our conversations. So it's been like a very broad um, kind of from all angles. And then in the product-specific space, we are trying to introduce more signals that we know are more favorable to women. So problem-solving rather than uh, maths and science marks uh, behavioral readiness because it's something that we can uh, we can use to boost the profiles of young women um, and work around showing both young people themselves as an empowerment angle but then also employers the skills that young people get working in the, the hidden economy the invisible economy and the informal sector Radu, any other thoughts on this? Or if well, so here's a, a, a little story from one of our, our partners in Kenya, which I think speaks to um, the different features that seem to, to matter for, for women. But so we've been working with this group in, in Kenya called Mesh. I don't know if that name resonates with anybody, but it's kind of like a LinkedIn version, but for aimed at, you know, youth in urban areas in Kenya. Right? And, and, and while it's not a job, matching platform, we all kind of know why someone updates their LinkedIn profile, right? Like they do it because they're trying to switch jobs or, uh, you know. So, so interestingly, even over a short period of a year, right, Mesh, uh, you know, they have a fairly, fairly good system of tracking what happens on their, on, on their, on their platform. So they, they went from having 25% of, uh, of job applications being you know, women's application to a little over 42%. Right? So it's still, you know, still less than, than half, but it's also double, right? Um, so one of the, there's like small things that they do and, and bigger things that they do. So some of the bigger things that they do is, um, you know, the, the featured content that they put on their, on their platform speaks to women, to issues that matter for women. So for example, they talk about uh, safety, like how, what are the things that that you know? How can you make your uh, job more safe or more um, easier to get to the job, particularly if you, if you work after hours? They, ish, they they talk about things like harassment in the in the in the job place. So they they change the content, but they also do small things like what pictures do you see when you go on the platform? Like in, moving from kind of a mix of uh, kind of gender neutral pictures, like their stories have like women. There, so you go there and you see. Well, look, this platform has a lot of people that look like me, and therefore, it's it's a place that I want to hang out in. So there are these things that you can do uh, to make your your platform more uh, attractive to to women. Um, Any yeah. other? Yeah, yeah. I just you, yes, I just you seem to. <laughs> I just wanted to um, add that the the platforms do give a lot of information. Right. So, and I think it's, it's up to us as researchers to be able to figure out what kind of information matters to who. Right. So it's not like you're just pushing, oh, yes, you have been matched. But um, perhaps if you, if you present the information in a certain way for men versus women, then perhaps maybe you'll be um, uh, catering to the needs of, of these um, women um, more. 
So I think that is something interesting that um, perhaps some of these um, platforms could consider, you know, to be able to help. And which is a, which is a nice segue into another um, sort of set of questions that I had for all of you, which is what do you think are um, sort of interesting and relevant, and important research um, directions here? Um, I, and I think, you know, I'd love to have these different perspectives represented here, both from your sense of sitting between a platform and academic research, uh, your sense, Kate, from sort of your, your recent review of the academic evidence, Belinda's view from maybe how would you engage, what is, you know, a piece of advice for a researcher looking to partner with uh, a Harambi uh, or a platform like Harambi? And Radu, through your lens, what, you know, what would be important pieces of evidence? What have we learned, and but what do we need to learn? Um, anyone who wants to start? I... Okay, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I can start. Um, in in our work, in in our interactions with the job seekers after we piloted um, this this concept, one of the things that both job seekers and firms raised was the issue of um, cyber security. Um, we, and, and that that was something that we hadn't actually thought about until, like you know, they actually brought it up. So, for from from the firm side, they are um, wondering. I'm, I mean, I'm used to getting my workers from um, my current workers who can vouch for you know their safety. <laughs> like you know, now you are asking me to go onto a platform. How sure am I that this person that I'm bringing? Um, I can trust the person in my office or in my space. So um, in our case, I, I remember one of the um, recommendations that um, suggestions that they had given us was to try and link, in our case, the, the Ghana card, which mm -hmm. is the ID. ID. So once there's that linkage, um, it's a signal to them that, okay, um, I have the national ID card or the, the national ID of this person on the platform, maybe it's not revealed to anybody, but then we, we can figure out a way to um, assure the, the um, firm that there is a way to right. track or trace this person if something happens. And it takes my mind back to even um, with the gender issue, right? Um, we are saying that um, online portals are helpful. Yes, you know, they are not the silver bullet, but at least they, they to some extent, they do help. But it also creates this new challenge for the safety of women. There, there could be um, instances where people, um, you know, that scams on the on, on online. People can actually produce these jobs that are targeting women to be able to do whatever. But we, we need to be able to um, put some features on the platform that assures the safety of these women if they should take up these jobs. So I'm thinking that um, our next step in terms of generating these kinds of evidence, we should be able to, we should be thinking about some of these safety issues mm -hmm. um, online, these cyber security issues. Yeah, thank you. So one thing I would I would add, and and this is not, I'm, I won't say like which topics are interesting. I think I think I think Kate, you're in a much better position to to say that. But the things that are interesting to to us at the at on the We Team and probably at the Gates Foundation in general are research ideas that have like a clear path to impact, right? Like we have, um, you know, our, our division president, her favorite question is, so what, you know? So it's, um, it's all, you know, very interesting if you uncover some, something we didn't know before. And I don't want to discount the value of, of new information or changing people's prior beliefs. But if there's no clear path to, okay, if you act on that finding, what happens like if that's not clear it's it's a bit like of course interesting but it's not all that all that compelling and you know maybe to the, the the people who are in their phd program that's like one more challenge like now i have to not only worry about getting my my tables formatted right in in latex but, <laughs> but i also have to worry about my the policy implications of of, of, of my paper it's hard like it's 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 probably harder than the, the formatting right um <laughs> and actually, it, it's so hard, and I'll be confess here, like, my PhD dissertation had zero 
policy implications. Um, and I and I didn't talk to any policymakers, and somehow it it was fine. But but look, it's 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 hard, and I I don't I just want to flag that. You know, it, it's really important for us at the foundation to see research that leads to, to policy impact. Thank you. Um, so, so I'm, I'm not going to say anything that was in the review because you can read the review and it's sort of more in the like academic headspace of, of thinking about things. So I'll be slightly more controversial. Um, I think the first thing for me in this agenda is that we've got to start thinking about the general equilibrium effects yeah. um, of these interventions because everything we've done has been in the because we were able to randomize it it's all been in these small scale randomized controlled trials and we don't know at all if simply what we're doing is shuffling the queue you know is there a person who got the intervention and we find in our trial that they got the job but it's because somebody else didn't get the intervention who didn't get the job so we have to start answering the question about do any of these types of interventions including the online job platforms increase overall labor demand. Otherwise, we can, we're can we talking about youth unemployment, but we're not actually doing anything to solve it. That's a really hard thing to do. I just finished writing a research proposal thinking with Harambi about how we would do that. So actually, you know, we've got this national scale platform. We can not now start doing some of the stuff that's been done in France and Sweden and other places to test these questions. But, you know, is this something that the donor community has appetite to fund? Like, is it uh, the, the scale of these studies is very difficult because there's no admin data in these places. So I think it's a really important question. We don't know the answer to it, and it's quite hard to execute. Um, but I still think it's it's the sort of first order thing. Um, the second question, I think, for me is um, very broadly, I think we've <laughs> we have this idea that perfect information is good for firms. And I don't think firms want perfect information. I think that's just too much of a step in these labor markets. Like they're not, as, as you've been saying, they're not labor markets in which there's high levels of trust. There's not, you know, it's not a, a world where firms think they can have perfect information. So I think we need to start thinking about interventions that you know, it's not like just the firm hiring someone who they know from church. It's a bit of a broader pool, but it still has some of the assurances that they need to transact economic activity in these sorts of environments. Yeah. And I have, I've never seen interventions that sort of take that lens. We're all using our model and saying, oh, we want perfect information. But just from everything I know about employer, how employers hire, I don't think that that's what they want. Um and then I think the third thing is about psychological costs of search. Mm -hmm. Like I've, I've spoken to hundreds of job seekers now, and you know I, I don't even know how our models apply when the chance is you're never going to get a job, a formal job. Um, and I, I just think you know we we write down these search models, and they've ne it's never uh, mirrored to me. You know what does it, what does search and motivation search look like for a young person who's facing a 30% unemployment rate and, and probably knows that number. Um, so I think trying to understand a little bit more about, uh, you know, stop stopping calling things, uh, you know, irrational behaviors, but trying to think a bit about, you know, <laughs> what work seekers ought to be doing in those contexts before we jump in with information interventions and being like, oh, you don't know what the average wage is in jobs of your type, you silly, irrational person. I think it would be better to take a little bit of a, a step back and um, you know, think a bit harder about the models and putting them in context. Yeah, and I think in the firm space, I mean, when we talk to employers, I think they're all quite aware that the CV is an integrated, out, outdated way to, to measure potential and get information. Um, but there's still such a barrier to like them taking the next step and then accepting a, a new signal in place of that. And certainly, like I think, what well, one of the reasons why our partnerships have been so valuable for us is just in terms of adding that credibility to these new signals. Because you are, as a job tech platform, um, you you can't be impartial because you want people to put their jobs in your platform, and just that dynamic means it's impossible to be. Um, just really transparent about about these signals and and their ability to de-risk for firms. Um, I also think, you know, the reality of particularly in South Africa is that that's very real. That young people won't find a job, um, and 
we both want young people to be engaged in that work-seeking behavior, um, staying in it, potentially finding a job. But while they're doing that, we have to do a lot of advocacy work around alternative means of producing your livelihood. Um, and in South Africa, there's a lot of stigma around sort of making your own money uh, in community. We're talking micro, micro enterprise. Um, and we're hoping that by positioning that kind of opportunity at the same level as a job opportunity, just through the visual hierarchy of the way that we present information to young people, we're hoping to do something around like introducing better social norms around that alternative space, because a hundred percent we have to do, we have to do both. Thank you so much. I did. I, could not agree. Uh, yeah, lots of lots of things I uh, vigorously uh, was nodding to. Um, maybe I, I do want to sort of open it to the to the audience, but very quick fire hits perhaps on sort of something that maybe I'm sort of biased, but viewing the lens to the eyes of a government and through societal change and real you know thinking at societal scale, thinking that goes beyond the cute researcher led intervention, thinking that goes beyond just a platform. Um, maybe if I can get from all of you um, some some quick thoughts on, you know, what is it that we can do to get governments to think about public employment services, perhaps in a more tech-enabled, perhaps in a more inclusive way? What is it that we can do to foster exchange between both private and, and public platforms, uh, again, both through the lens of um, you know, the work that Harambi is doing in a partnership of actors in South Africa um, and what role do researchers play in exactly, Radu, as you say, you know, in, 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 in trying to help create evidence that's not just in a small bubble of, of a tightly controlled academic experiment, but evidence that helps us think about solutions that scale. That's a very, very big picture, abstract question. So we can be very quick before handing it over to the audience. I don't know who wants to go first. I mean, I, I would, if, if, the, if the question is how to convince governments to, to enter and to you know, uh, subsidize this space, I think there's an there's a interesting story uh, from the history of the United States. I think this is a, f a number that gets often miscited. I probably I'll miscited too, but... Um, <laughs> This paper wrote by by Chang Tai Xie uh -huh. shows that you know the U.S. has lost about twenty percent of the GDP through the discriminations in the labor market, mainly against women and against black men, right? So it's a for for a government, it's it's not a nice thing to have like a, a you know a, fun, a well functioning job market. Like it's it's you know GDP lost if you if you don't address these these imperfections in the in the labor market. Yeah, maybe just in terms of, of convincing government to be a, a more um, collaborative partner. So our route towards that was very much that we established a model and a platform and evidence that we could do that work before we really engaged with government. And I think that having that kind of... Um, very practical, tangible, numbers-based conversation rather than like a high-level concept around how you could support has, has been really instrumental. But even there, it's been like a lot of relationship building and, um, you know, identifying players in government that are willing and interested and able to help you and then working with them. So it's certainly not like a one-size-fits-all approach I'm going to be positive right at the end. I think, um, I think we're actually in a really exciting moment because of some movement that's happened in another space. So, um, you know, cash transfers in the developing world exploded during COVID. Um, you know, I think, I think the number of beneficiaries kind of doubled. Uh, many governments expanded programs hugely and they haven't rolled them back. I think there's a lot more political will for welfare of that kind in poorer than rich countries, which is which is great. But I think there's now a kind of policy moment where a lot of governments are wanting to add something onto those programs so that then, you know, they, they sort of feel a bit more like they're helping people into employment. 
And so I think there's a, I think there's a real moment for trying to link kind of, uh, online labor platforms, you know, some sort of, uh, uh, job center on your phone, um, that we've got a lower cost version of the whole kind of network that exists added to welfare in developed countries. I think it serves a political purpose for governments, but I also actually think it could be a great, a great way of reaching a bigger pool of recipients. So I think there's quite an exciting moment at the moment that's sort of been made by COVID by accident. Um, yeah, and I, you know, in many countries that uh, there's a big pool of unemployed people who are now on the books for those cash programs that could be reached quite easily. So I think that's quite an er- exciting area of intersection. And there's obviously a ton of interesting work happening and to be done on the sort of question of economic inclusion programs and how we turn folks or how we bring folks from an economic inclusion or safety net program into employment into gainful employment, which is another huge, hugely important question that um, that I think is quite fascinating and important to work on. Monica, any other thoughts on this? And then we can open it. Yeah, I was just going to add that um, for, I know there's this um, new World Bank um, initiative for many, um, you know, countries in Africa, the labor market information, um, you know, systems. I know most countries are trying to build these systems. So it's an opportunity to um, make these government entities actually see how they can leverage what we have actually learned from these online portals to make, to transform their work. So in Ghana, for instance, if you look at um, the public employment um, centers, they actually manually take, um, you know, the forms that job, a job seeker would walk in and fill, and then a firm will come in and fill, and then they actually try to, like, you know, manually match these two. But if you have a platform that um, allows you to collect this data very easily and then a match is established, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to be able to transform the process, the operations. Aside that, um, these platforms also have these back-end data, which is I think is very, very useful. Um, and it goes back to what Kate was saying about the general equilibrium kind of things. That kind of um, labor market um, information, if we know that the, the labor demand that is coming in from the job seeker side, if you see the um, the kinds of skills that are, be, are being requested for by firms, this actually tells us in some way, like, you know, what is happening, what is, where is the demand, where is the supply? So gradually we get to learn a bit more and um, to then fashion these um, interventions that would help to solve these things. So I think um, I would agree that there's an opportunity with particularly this initiative, which is across many African countries to be able to accept uh, the findings that we are learning from the um, online portals. Thank you so much, Monica. And it, uh, this really resonates because the beginning of some of my work in this space has actually been working with the government of Ethiopia and um, one of the policymakers leading us into one of these public employment services and showing us the big book where on the left side was the supply side and on the right side, the demand side, and then someone making these matches manually. Maybe let's pause it here and then turn to the audience for uh, questions. I don't know if you have a micro. Yes, we do. Okay, wonderful. Maybe we start in the back because that's where I saw some of the first hands going up. Um, and if you could briefly in, uh, identify yourself, uh, say who you are, um, and then uh, try and uh, keep the questions concise. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Scholastic Odiambo uh, from African Economic Research Consortium. Uh, those are very great insight on job matching. My issue is that uh, maybe this research is not capturing this, or the intervention might not have uh, realized this. Uh, in the job market, we have a lot of behavioral biases. Uh, in terms of the action, um, uh, if I lean towards the women issue, you'll find that we still have patriarchal biases on the role of women in jobless. And uh, I can say that if a young man uh, who has just graduated from college were to compete for a job with a 20-year experience lady in the room, the young man might get a job. Or the suspicion on their skills may be the same. Um, and you find that today um, uh, the biases which I was talking about is causing a lot of moral hazard and uh, adverse selection, meaning that we 
have a new policy, so we have to keep it. Like uh, we are in a boardroom of 10 men, and they realize we don't have a lady. They will have to look for a potential lady to fill the gap. So we are having those biases. I knew with the Pareto improvement moments by governments, whereby governments have affirmative actions, we still find ourselves still in those biases. So I'm looking at the point where how does research capture this and what sensitization can we have towards this? And this is not, not, not because it's something which we can avoid, but I think it's long-term patriarchal narrative of woman in the job place. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe we'll collect three. Um, we'll stay there in the back, um, up there. Maybe we'll take these four in the back and then uh, turn it to the panelists. Hi, I had a question. Oh, sorry, I'm supposed to introduce Can you introduce yourself? Sorry, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm Daksh. I'm a student at Oxford. Uh, I had a question about the potential of online platforms uh, to help tackle statistical discrimination in hiring or maybe even exacerbated because one of the reasons that uh, well firms rely on networks is that they use that as a signal for quality and productivity very often right uh, and one thing that online labor markets do is somewhat anonymize that signal and take away from that signal um, at the same time you can imagine a world where for example you were to maybe hide information about names and other indicators of gender from firms uh, or in the case of India, like even things like caste are often signaled by name. But at the same time, would do you think that would be like something that firms would be okay with? Would that be palatable to them? Uh, because you're essentially taking away information. And as you discussed, like there is an incentive to give more information to firms. Thank you. Um, and I think there's two more. Hi, uh, my name is Garima. I'm based at Azim Premji University in Bangalore, India. Uh, I'm starting some work on job market frictions and the school to work transition. So this was very exciting uh, to hear. Thank you. Um, I was wondering uh, if you had thoughts on what are the kinds of jobs that see the most attrition um, and also who are the kinds of workers that end up leaving uh, earliest? Thanks. And then, and then uh, the gentleman over there, and then I think we'll turn to the panelists. Thank you. Um, Callum Hamilton from University of Groningen. I completely understand the focus on youth unemployment, uh, given the demographic situation and other things. But I do wonder a little bit about the potential for the exclusion of older workers if there's such an emphasis on digital platforms. And even if it's fairly analog platforms, that's considered exclude a lot of people. And therefore, I wondered, considering mobile money is in part being so successful because you can also access it through agents and through people that can help you. And in a sort of half digital, half manual way, if instead of trying to transition entirely from uh, physical to digital, it might be through a fusion of the two that actually the greatest uh, gains in matching and access can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I will um, abuse my role here and just answer to this question that I completely agree. And that's why I think, you know, for trying to be successful in this space, we need to work as an ecosystem that uh, links these digital solutions with in-person physical infrastructure that governments might already have. And uh, one of our partners in Ethiopia started as a digital platform and now has built some physical centers from an inclusion perspective because they realized that otherwise they couldn't reach some of the harder to reach folks. Um, lots of great questions that I will not uh, uh, answer. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I will turn this to the panelists. We had some questions on behavioral biases, patriarchal biases, uh, statistical discrimination, exclusion of older workers. Any responses here? Any thoughts? I, I could say something about the very first question on um, the biases. I think that that is um, a really, really difficult one to handle because this relates to norms. But I think um, one area that we could start um, tackling this issue from would be policy at the top. If, if you think of child care policy, for instance, mm -hmm. I mean, the only different, the only reason why. Um, a woman may 
not the only reason, but one of the reasons would be um, the reason, one of the reasons why a woman would prefer to have like a flexible job, for instance, um, prefer a flexible job is so that she can combine, um, you know, working with some of these other domestic responsibilities, right? So if she has a, 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 a child um, that she needs to take care of, then that's, the, her, that's, that's her first priority. But if there's a policy that helps to take care of that, then at least she will be freed in a way to be able to, um, you know, also go into the labor market and actually fully signal that I'm not only looking for um, flexible jobs, I'm not looking for part-time jobs, but I'm looking for full-time jobs because a policy at the top has actually created that. I know there's this whole movement now, there's a lot of discussions around child care and I'm hoping that um, you know, most of the, 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 a lot of the talk that is going on would actually translate into actions. So we see child care being tackled head on so we can free women to go into the labor market to fully participate. Great point. Thanks. So that was, that was what I would, that's, that's a great point. Yeah. Thanks. So maybe two things from my side. So, um, just to reiterate, like we need human based and technology based solutions. I think that. Uh, one of the failings of the technology community is definitely to think that there's, you know, a magical solution that's going to solve it and that mm -hmm. the community and the people around it are will just sort of innately happen. Um, and I think that definitely as someone who moved into the social impact space from technology, uh, if you have a, a healthy and willing ecosystem that can save very bad tech, but if you don't have the wooden ecosystem, it doesn't matter how shiny whatever you built is, right? So I think that's just really, really central to like the philosophy behind this. And then in terms of obscuring certain information, um, I think that there would be pushback from firms mm -hmm. in terms of trying to hide that information entirely. But there's a lot that you can do in a product space that lets you push signals to the front of someone's sort of process of making decisions purely visually. So for example, on our rank lists, um, gender is not on the top level. So if you wanted to go see, or oh, is this person uh, identifying as male or female, you have to go one level deeper. So there's a lot that you could do just in terms of playing with the UI that presents the signals that you think are more inclusive as the signals to use, but you obviously have to have those signals and you have to have the buy-in from firms that those signals are, are as useful. Yeah, I mean, I guess just to respond to the sort of what would firms be okay with? Would they be okay with, you know, losing the info? I think, I think very, um, so one of the projects we're working on with Harambi now, which, uh, Lucas Pencil, um, who's in the audience and, uh, some others have, have been working on the, so we, we see in South Africa this real, uh, gender gap in qualifications. So, um, you know, women tend to have, uh, less good um, qualification, they also then have less good labor market outcomes. Um, but we have this this sort of um, interesting stylized fact that firms actually report, uh, you know, very little of a gender gap, if anything, somewhat of a gender preference for hiring women, because they see them as being more uh, reliable, um, you know, often they have children who are dependents and they're single parents, and so they, they you know, they'll, they'll arrive so we thought, okay, how do we design an intervention with a gender lens, but that's not necessarily making that clear to firms? And so what we've done uh, working with Harambi is develop an additional uh, sort of, it's called a behavioral screener, but it's kind of a soft skills score. And the key thing about it is that women do as well as men on this, on this metric. And that accords with the sort of stylized fact, you know, many, many women are very reliable and arrive and, um, you know, uh, men are as well, but there's no gender gap in that. And so we've, we've looked at using that screener to rank people, um, for, sh for shortlists, um, for the firm compared to, um, using traditional criteria. Um, and actually we find that firms without knowing that that they know the screener is there, but they don't know that it, you know anything about the the gender lens. Just by using that behavioural screener in the ranking, firms are more likely to make a hire, um, and that uh, women who are in that who who have that that screener used are more likely to find a job. So it's an example of 
uh, the you know no, the gender doesn't appear anywhere in the the f what the firm sees about that intervention. They don't know much about the mechanics of it, but designing the way that the platform interacts with firms with a gender lens, you can actually achieve gender um, equity Im impact. So I think that's that's sort of the approach I would say taking. I wouldn't wouldn't go into firms saying, oh, we're taking the stuff away from you. Uh, you no longer will see this piece of information that you have. But I do think it's about taking a little bit more of a, a gender sensitive lens to how we do the whole of the kind of market design. And I think it can or our evidence suggests it can be very successful. And, and maybe, I mean, just adding to this based on the other work that we're doing with Harambe, that's exactly following the spirit of trying to make things more visible, not explicitly through a gender lens, but by making, you know, this unseen economy in South Africa more visible, I think we're trying to do something that will pro over proportionally benefit female job seekers on this platform by trying to make unpaid care work visible and the, the skills and the human capital that derives from unpaid care work. It's not an explicit gendered intervention, but it does, I think, uh, hopefully transform the, the needle a little bit or move the needle a little bit. Um, Radu, any other final reactions? Otherwise, I would maybe turn it over to the audience for another round. Yeah. Um, maybe then coming to the front of the room, I see uh, Diva, Paolo uh, over there, and maybe these four. Thank you. Um I guess one question I had was just on, you know, the reach of these platforms um, and the coverage that they you know, have the potential to reach. I mean, from a policymaker point of view, you want something that's going to help the general population or uh, poor people rather than just sort of the creme de la creme um, of the economy. And I'm wondering what promising efforts, evidence or interventions you've seen to really get, uh, expand the potential um, of these platforms um, for poorer women and men as well. Who's next? Hi, uh, Apura Bhatia here from Birmingham. So I was thinking about the new challenges that tech brings and how do we introduce uh, trust into the platforms and increase more take up in them? And also if these are substituting to traditional job search means or are they complements? How do we think about them? Paulo Falco, University of Copenhagen. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for such an interesting uh, discussion. I'd like you to comment on the cost of setting up these platforms, because as uh, technology advances, one can easily slip into the, I'm sure, very simplistic thinking, this is eventually costless to do. It's something so easy, it's a no-brainer. We should just do it because, you know, it's hopefully not going to harm anyone, it's not going to cost anything, so we should just do it. But I'm sure that, you know, your work probably speaks to the fact that it's far from costless, but I'd like to hear where we are in this respect. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Sebastian Kranz, uh, Kiel Institute for the World Economy. Um, I, I would like to kind of expand this a bit. Like, I, I think we've talked mostly about like solving local labor market inefficiencies through this platform. Uh, but I have also increasingly seen that these platforms actually solve global labor market inefficiencies. Mm -hmm. Like we, we see a lot of people in Africa working for big tech in some form or another through call centers. But I've also seen like there's also high quality programming jobs and, and some of those people are based in Africa. I've, I've, I've just seen even AI startups in Silicon Valley having employees, uh, in Africa. Uh, and I, I think that seems to go totally against this kind of brain brain model where, where uh, high quality uh, Africans tend to, to migrate and, and send remittances. Uh, so I think that could have uh, major implications also, may, also maybe for structural change, right? We were talking about premature de deindustrialization and low productivity services, but, but some of, if you, if you get a job with a big tech, you, you are, you're doing high productivity services and, and you're engaged in your local political community source. So I don't know if there's any research on the effects of solving global labor market inefficiencies to this platform or what they could mean for like economic transformation in, in Africa. 
Thank you so much. I thought you were going to go somewhere else. I thought you were going to go towards migration and spatial reallocation because, you know, I think we all know that lab one labor market failure is across space. Um, and, you know, what you're saying is we don't need to move people across space because the jobs change in nature. But I would also say, um, you know, people still should and could move across space and there are large failures in labor markets across space. So I do think there's an interesting migration spin to your argument as well. And I would say the bank uh, has some interesting work on these global uh, gig work platforms. I would also abuse the position and say uh, um, uh, to Diva that I think in our work in Ethiopia, um, the platform we've worked with does not have much of an, I think, inclusion impact up to the point where we've linked it with the public employment service because that's, that's where adversely selected job seekers go. And so our ability to reach low-skilled women came from working with the legacy infrastructure that typically finds adversely selected people. Um, but uh, opening it up to the panel, thank you so much for these questions. Um, in terms of um, the reach, I think um, they have the potential, depending on what features um, the platform would have. So if, you, if the platform is only mobile-based, for instance, you will be excluding a lot of people. So um, I think one of the options that um, should be explored would be the text-based ones, one of the options would be um, should be that so that a lot of people would be able to assess that. I think it ties in with the um, the cost question. I think we have done a lot. There are a lot of these isolated um, platforms, but so far I, I actually haven't seen any um, cost effectiveness, like you know, analysis of it. So I think it'll be interesting to see um, for us to be able to see what the costs are. One would imagine that. Because it's serving a lot of people, maybe the startup is really expensive, but then if you spread it over time, like, you know, the per unit cost would reduce. But I think we would need to be able to um, rigorously test that to see what um, these, these would be. Somebody also asked a question about are people combining um, sessions? I think that's an interesting question. I, 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 I think people would, but I don't know. Um, that if, if once I get onto a platform, does that then stop me from asking my family and friends to help me find a job? I don't know. So on costs, I think that the, the cost efficiencies really come in when you're servicing a community that is, for example, very rural and otherwise excluded. So for um, one of the public stimulus programs, they hired school assistants into um, schools in rural areas, the cost of doing that matching using humans and a face-to-face -face model would have been astronomical. So the infrastructure that we had allowed us to use that. So definitely in terms of reaching certain communities, there's a, a very real cost saving. Um, I think in terms of expecting that it ultimately um, is, is free to run is, is, yeah, I mean, it would be nice, but I don't think it's very likely. Um, it's also about just how technology companies approach these kinds of interventions because really like the part of um, Harambee that takes that takes a, a lot of money and time is the call center, so to support young people because um, digital literacy is an issue, at least with the entry-level talent that we engage with. They need extra support. Um, some of them don't have access to mobile devices. They still need to go into a center. Um, and that obviously just means that like it's it's never going to be the standalone thing that just works. Um, I do think though that a lot of the cost savings could come in if people were more um, just aware of the initial approach in building out this kind of technical platform. And this is very much uh, not what we did. So um, the view of Harambee has been quite different and our mission has been quite different because we've been trying to work out how best we are placed to to sort of try and help um, young people into employment. And as such, during the time I've been in the company, we've had to rebuild everything from scratch twice. So I think if you're going in with the point of view of creating something at a societal level, um, it really helps. And I think that that thinking is hard because people go in for MVPs, they go for proof of concepts, they go for small pilots. 
and actually having that infrastructure from the beginning is what would ultimately save you costs, but obviously requires more investment up front. I mean, I think um, just to say on the on the cost issue, one of the things that's been totally game-changing about what Harambe's done is been securing this zero rating status. So I don't know if you can say a little bit more about what that is. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, the cost of data in South Africa is horrific um, compared to, to similar markets. And data access really is is a crucial issue. Um, as part of the PYEI, they've managed to secure for all of the platforms in their network. It's free for use, so it doesn't cost you money to surf. Um, and that sort of has just had a, an amazing benefit in terms of like access and uh, breaking down that barrier. Although even then, when we have partners that some of the application process is on another channel, young people's journeys can become fragmented. So it's it's definitely helped, um, but not a not a silver bullet. So I I thought, Paula, your question was more about you know if, if if these things are becoming cheaper and cheaper, why not just let them you know any developer can write it, and I think. I mean, first of all, there's nothing you can do to stop that from happening. But why I do think it's important for us to be, for us, meaning like people, like on the research policy, you know, um, philanthropy to pay attention is because, you know, designing for uh, gender inclusivity doesn't, is not the default. Like you would end up with a bunch of, you know, platforms that have no intentionality about gender, right? And then you're like, be like, you know, and who knows which one will grow, but you want to make sure you at least seed the, the bigger ones. And so they're built from the start with all sorts of inclusion built in. Because they're, I think it's, it's, it's kind of naive to say that people will figure out the inclusion by themselves. Like if you're not, because it doesn't automatically pay, it's, you know, it, it takes some effort. So I think that's why it's good to, to be intentional and maybe, you know, dedicate some money in the design so that you have those features. Any final quick questions? We have maybe time for one more. Otherwise, okay, two. But two, if you promise to be super quick, look us and then over there. Hi, um, my name is Lukas Sensel from Peking University. My question is simply about like the financial sustainability. Like, is there any kind of business model that could sustain these uh, platforms in the long term without like? donor support or government support? Yeah, thank you. Um, Moritz Paul, I'm a PhD student at Brown. Um, we just finished a large census in a rural area in Malawi where it turns out all firms combined in the best of the seasons together could provide jobs for 3% of the adult population in the area. And granted, Nairobi, Addis, don't look like rural Malawi, but my prior would have been improving the matching on a, on a, on the labor market that is this lopsided is maybe not the best use of our resources if the demand for labor is just so much lower. And I kind of missed the part where you tell us this is the, this is the big thing that there is actually this potential. I'll be quick, two minutes to go. I'll answer this by saying that's why I do think there is a role for digital technology and platform and certification of skills, et cetera, to play with market failures across space in labor markets. Because clearly that is such a lopsided labor market. Clearly people are going to have to move to places where there are more jobs. And I do think there's some really interesting potential for this, uh, including across borders. But that's my view. Um, any of the panelists want to quickly respond to this point or Lucas? Very, very quick. I was just going to say, I'm not, I don't think we should be trying to make them sustainable. Like the many developed country economies rely on some sort of labor market information and intermediation as a public exactly. good. Like, exactly. you know, so Absolutely. I, I think it's an, uh, it, I mean, it's been very hard to make firms pay for these services, but there are services that in many economies firms have that the state provides and 
I think I mean, I've never done the cost benefit calculation, but you know, the, having someone in a formal job is really great on a range of metrics. So, um, including you know what they're able to give to their dependents and extended networks. So, I think it's a really good question to ask. But I think I think sort of comparing it to how most economies uh, work is probably should be our our benchmark. I think. Maritza, I mean, I take your point. I think the, uh, the rural Malawi, I'm not sure any of us are, are punting the man matching platforms there, but I, I think that was going a little bit to my question about what, are, what effect do these sorts of interventions have at scale. Mm -hmm. I feel like we kind of got into the trap a little bit of saying, um, you know, the, uh, any spillover effect has got to be bad. You also get positive spillover effects, and there's a lot of theory that might suggest that you know, if you, if firms think they have more information about workers, they might hire more, and maybe that's the equilibrium we're trying to get into. Um, so yeah, so I think point point taken on rural Malawi, but you know, let, let's also look for uh, effects at scale, so we might find positive as well as negative ones. Unless there's any final burning reflections, I would say maybe I will leave it here. I'm looking at the panelists. Yes, I see nodding or sh shake and hats being nodded and shake. I, um, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much to the panelists for what I thought was a really, really interesting discussion. And, uh, thanks so much for you in the audience. Um, this leaves me to close the CSAE conference 2024. I am. So thrilled, and I think I can speak on behalf of the entire CSAE team, uh, that you all came, that you presented such amazing work. We saw wonderful, wonderful, wonderful papers. I, you know, that it's always cool to review them early on, uh, and then see them be presented. Um, thank you so, so much for being here. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's truly an honor to have so many, uh, wonderful, uh, presenters. Don't be strangers um, until next year. Uh, there's going to be another conference, pretty sure, probably uh, without the temporary structures. There is a, a journal, there is a fellowship, there are scholarships, there's a bunch of work that we're doing at CSAE. Stay in touch, um, connect with us, connect with any of the CSAE uh, 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 researchers, connect to any of us here on stage. Um, and uh, we will hopefully see you again next year. Before letting you go, I also just wanted to thank the CSAE team, uh, Ro, Sue, and uh, Fiona, Claire, the entire staff at St. Catherine's College, and all of the student helpers. If you guys want to come up here on stage, I have a, some chocolate for you, and we can applaud your work. Thank you so much. <laughs>